without going into war, but they also notably won it through heavy-handed use of propaganda. Hitler discusses propaganda at length in Mein Kampf, but his basic philosophy is that propaganda exists in order to convert people to your cause that are not already the true believers. And the way to do it is to project simple, strong messages and to relentlessly repeat them over and over. So that's what he did. He bombarded the German public relentlessly with propaganda. To get a sense of what that looked like, let's look at William Shirer's account, who was a journalist that lived in Nazi Germany until 1940 and who wrote The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. Here was his experience. I myself was to experience how easily one is taken in by a lying and censored press and radio in a totalitarian state. It was surprising and sometimes consternating to find that notwithstanding the opportunities I had to learn the facts and despite one's inherent distrust of what one learned from Nazi sources, a steady diet over the years of falsifications and distortions made a certain impression on one's mind and often misled it. No one who has not lived for years in a totalitarian land can possibly conceive how difficult it is to escape the dread consequences of a regime's calculated and incessant propaganda. Often in a German home or office, or sometimes in a casual conversation with a stranger in a restaurant, a beer hall, a cafe, I would meet with the most outlandish assertions from seemingly educated and intelligent persons. It was obvious that they were parroting some piece of nonsense that they had heard on the radio or read in the newspapers. Sometimes one was tempted to say as much, but on such occasions, one was met with such a stare of incredulity, such a shock of silence, as if one had blasphemed the Almighty, that one realized how useless it was to even try to make contact with a mind which had become warped and for whom the facts of life had become what Hitler and Goebbels, with their cynical disregard for the truth, said they were. So unlike fascist Italy, much of the German public ended up buying into Nazi ideology, and many of them took it up ravenously particularly young people, a demographic Hitler specifically targeted. Given our time constraints, I think the best thing I can do here is to just give you a snapshot of what that looked like. And I think the best way to do that is to show you another passage. So this is a passage from another history of Nazi Germany on student activity and book burning. On April 12th, 1933, the Nazi German Students Association's Office for Press and Propaganda announced a nationwide action against the un-German spirit which was to climax in a literary purge, a cleansing by fire. The students presented their action as a response to a worldwide Jewish smear campaign against Germany and an affirmation of traditional German values. They published a blacklist of un-German authors. Then the authors are listed, and then he talks about how the students were influenced by Martin Luther burning the papal bull. And then it continues. For the students, the tradition of book burning was associated not with reactionary impulses, but with defiance against authority and with strong nationalist sentiments. Placards publicized the 12 Theses, which attacked Jewish intellectualism, asserted the need to purify German language and literature, and demanded that universities be centers of German nationalism. Germany's most dangerous adversary is the Jew, the document read. If a Jew writes in German, he is lying. The German who writes in German, but thinks in an un-German way, is a traitor. We want to eliminate the lie. We want to brand the treason. We demand from the German student the will and ability to overcome Jewish intellectualism and all the liberal manifestations of decay associated with it. Students and professors should be selected on the basis of their thinking in the German spirit. So this is the type of thinking that Hitler and the Nazi party were able to spread in Germany. So to recap, in Italy, you had the creation of the theory. And in Germany, you had a modification of the theory, and you had the theory work in practice. You had the theory coming alive. The last thing I want to cover is what would have happened if Nazi Germany hadn't been defeated? What was their vision for the world? And the best answer I could find is again with William Shirer, who based his answer on a captured trove of Nazi documents. So I'm going to read what he found. No comprehensive blueprint for the new order was ever drawn up but it is clear from the captured documents and from what took place that Hitler knew very well what he wanted it to be. A Nazi ruled Europe, whose resources would be exploited for the profit of Germany, whose people would be made the slaves of the German master race, and whose undesirable elements 
above all, the Jews, but also many Slavs in the East, especially the intelligentsia among them, would be exterminated. The Jews and the Slavic people were the Untermenschen, subhumans. To Hitler, they had no right to live, except as some of them, among the Slavs, might be needed to toil in the fields and the mines as slaves of their German masters. Not only were the great cities of the East, Moscow, Leningrad, and Warsaw, to be permanently erased, but the culture of the Russians and Poles and other Slavs was to be stamped out and formal education denied them. Their thriving industries were to be dismantled and shipped to Germany, and the people themselves confined to the pursuits of agriculture so that they could grow food for Germans, being allowed to keep for themselves just enough to subsist on. Europe itself, as the Nazi leaders put it, must be made Jew-free. He goes on to summarize the planned and actual devastation done to civilians and prisoners of war who were considered to be of the wrong blood or to have thought the wrong way and who had the misfortune of living within the grasp of the Nazis. It includes details from the concentration camps and medical experiments done by Nazi doctors. The result, I think, is the most harrowing 57 pages I've ever personally read. But if you need any more reason to be glad that the Axis powers lost World War II, Shirer's chapter on Germany's New Order might be worth reading. And on that note, I think that's enough said about Hitler's Germany. Okay, now we're finally at the question, what is fascism? To me, this entire video has been answering that question so far. It's been answering what fascism looks like in theory, and it's been giving glimpses into what it looks like in practice. But now we're looking for something shorter. We're looking for something that resembles a definition. The most popular approach I see tries to define fascism by going into the details of fascist movements. So they might talk about, a, say, a charismatic leader, or a democracy being in trouble, or maybe something about late-stage capitalism, things like that. And at the risk of being rude, to me that's obviously the wrong approach. We don't define any of the other major isms that way. We don't define liberalism based on, say, details of liberal movements, or socialism by details of socialist movements. So to me, we should obviously define it based on its core idea and not the details of the movements. And for me, the gold standard here is Karl Marx's definition of communism in the Communist Manifesto, where he says, the theory of the communists may be summed up in the single sentence, abolition of private property. 